Where's the... There we go. Tamam. Tamam. Tayyip. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wassalamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your families for making the time to study the Qur'an and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from the people of the Qur'an, Ya Rabb, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. We're going to inshallah begin with the recitation of Surah Al-Anfitar, Al-Anfitar, and then after the recitation inshallah, we'll do um, analysis and explanation of the Surah, Bidhni Allah ta'ala together. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا السماء فطرت وإذا الكواكب انتثرت وإذا البحار فجرت وإذا القبور بعثرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأدوار في العليم وإن الفجار في جحيم يصلون ما يوم الدين ولا هم عنها وما أدراك ما يوم الدين ثم ما أدراك ما يوم الدين يوم لا تملك نفس لنفس شيئا والأمر يومئذ so we're continuing alhamdulillah by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the analysis and discussion and commentary on juz amma and we mentioned in previous classes that juz amma focuses on articulating in very profound and concise words with depth but also accessibility very accessible very easy to understand articulating the basics of our deen the basics of our belief system what do we believe in as muslims why do we believe in those things as muslims where do we come from where are we going these questions become central to the discussions in juz amma and juz amma imagine subhanallah that you have the full quran from beginning to end and then juz amma the last part of 30 parts comes at the very end of the quran it's like the summary of everything you need to know presented in very simple way. And subhanAllah, Juz Amma is usually capturing the ayat of the Qur'an that were revealed at the beginning of the Qur'an. So chronologically at the beginning. Yet in the codex of the Qur'an, in the organization of the Qur'an, it comes at the end. Because sometimes it's important to go back to the basics, the foundations. You know, you look at the rest of the Qur'an and it subhanAllah details the discussions that we will find in Juz Amma. And just to recap, if you look at Juz Amna, if you look at Surah al naba which is the first Surah, as we said before, you're thrown into this debate, into this conversation, into these questions about the Day of Resurrection. Is it real? How do we know that it's real? Is it physical? Is it metaphysical? 
uh, how, do, how do we understand what's going on? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a glimpse into the discussions that are taking place about the day of resurrection. Then we have a nazi'at, and a nazi'at gives us a glimpse into the type of angels that exist. Angels that are quick, that are smooth, that are fast, that are efficient, extracting the souls of the believers in a smooth way, and those who are extracting the souls of the non-believers in a harsh way, because the soul of those who don't believe is gotten too comfortable with the dunya. It's gotten too excited to be, to be in this world. So it doesn't want to let go. It's scared of what is to come. But the soul of the believer is comfortable with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, enjoying what Allah gave it in the dunya, but looking forward to even more being with the companionship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those that are beloved by Allah and those that love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abasa gives us a bit of a different flavor. Abasa captures at least at the beginning. And of course the surahs, all of them have multiple layers. But at the beginning, it opens up with a, an image uh, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi trying to balance between the various commitments. The blind man that comes and the noble or the elite from societal point of view, the elite of Quraysh that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is investing time in, hoping that their decision or their acceptance of Islam would actually give the community security. The believing community will give them security. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet Muhammad Sallam not to spend too much time with the uh, people that could become Muslim but they're actually putting all these fronts and being arrogant and to actually focus more on those who are already coming looking for guidance, looking for purification. So don't let, the, don't let those who are coming to you looking for guidance be dismissed at the expense of the possibility of someone who's you know, greater, who's more powerful coming to Islam even though yes, they can bring a lot of security to the Muslim community the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is told, your job is to deliver the message to those who are willing to listen. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will take it to those who are genuine and looking truthfully. And then of course, in Surah Al-Takweer, we're given an image of the events that lead up to the resurrection, and then also an image of the things that will happen on the day of resurrection. The first six ayat capture the things that will lead up to resurrection, and then the second six ayat will capture the events that will happen, or some of the events that will happen on the day of resurrection. Now, somebody could say, you could say, why doesn't the Quran just give you a day by day account of what's going to happen on resurrection? Why are these ayat scattered? Why are they some of them in Surah Al Taqweer and some of them in Surah Al Inshiqaq and some of them in Surah Al Infitar as we're going to be looking at today? And the Quranic narrative, it's designed to capture specific moments, specific incidents from the day of resurrection that are relevant to a specific theme. It's like modern cinematography. There's a lot of foreshadowing, going back into the past, a lot of images being interwoven, interlaid on one another. Here's a little bit of this, here's a little bit of that. That's the Quranic narrative. So it captures specific moments from specific times, and in, in connecting, connecting those specific moments and times with themes that are very relevant in the surah. Like for example, in the previous, in the previous surah, Surah Al-Taqweer, there was a lot of focus on light and darkness. And then that was connected to the female that would be buried alive. Like the height of darkness, she herself is buried in darkness, literally and also metaphorically speaking, and then that's connected to the themes of light and darkness on the day of resurrection. And you'll find that that theme is interwoven throughout as we discussed before. But what about Surah Al-Infitar? Surah Al-Infitar and Surah Al-Mutafafeen, inshallah, hopefully we can get to both today. They capture, Surah Al-Infitar captures another image of the Day of Resurrection and also has a very important and powerful question. Powerful question. And I want us to imagine when we're hearing, subhanAllah, when we're hearing the commentary, it shouldn't come at the expense of actually leaving the ayat. And I mentioned this before and I will continue mentioning it over and over again because it is important. As we study these ayat, yes, you're going to basically understand the words and the details. But you have to actually live with the Qur'an. The Qur'an is not meant to be studied just sitting down in a chair and taking notes. That's a good space, that's a good start. But it's actually meant to be tasted. It's meant to be experienced in salah. So the only time that you're actually going to take the knowledge and turn it into concrete lived experience is when you take the Qur'an and the notes and you stand up in salah and you say Allahu Akbar and recite ayah by ayah and live it and imagine it and it becomes then a part of your, um, your, your, your uh, schema 
It influences and impacts the way that you see the world. So let us begin. Enough of an introduction, let us begin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the first ayah, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فطرت. I want you to imagine that, again, the things the Arabs take as constant, as fixed, Allah tells us to look at the sky and to imagine one day that the sky, just as we discussed in Surah al taqweer the sky would go through this act of infitar. Now it's important to understand the sarf. The sarf meaning the morphology of the words. When we see the word infatar, we have to do two things. Ask, the first question is, what does the word mean in its origin? And then the second thing is, what does the word mean in the form that it takes? Tamam? So what is, let's, let's do that together. So, we talked about إِذَا and إِذْ, we discussed that before, about the difference in an, a when and an if. So it's not an if statement, it's a when statement, meaning this will happen, it's just a matter of time. Now, in fatara, in fatara means to split, to cleave, to break, to uh, even bring into being. Those are words that are associated with the, the, the root, the root of fatara. Now, in fatara, in fatara, it's like in kasara, something that is happening, but it's happening outside of its control. So like imagine you have a glass, and that glass, like you're trying to hold it, but it falls, and then once it falls, khalas, that's it, it's good to break. It's, it's out of your control now. In fatara means the, the act is happening to it, and it has no control. It's happening to it, it's like in fa'ala. It's happening to it, but there's no control in terms of the, the, the sky itself, or the like, sama means anything that's above the universe, is cleaving, is cracking, is breaking, but it has no control. It's happening and it's beyond itself. And this is amazing because we, we, as you know, people living in the modern world, we're influenced by empiricism. And empiricism basically, or naturalism, tries to put laws that are predictable. The sky does this, nature does this, Mother Earth does this. And we almost give an agency to these natural phenomena, as if they're acting out of their own will. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He uses the words like in Fatara and in other parts in the Quran, Allah shifts the will of these entities from the natural entity itself to the one who made the natural entity. This is important. It's as if Allah is reminding us, the weather doesn't have control over itself, the sky doesn't have control over itself. The, star, the stars and the moon and the sun, they're not entities in the world that have a will. Yes, there are patterns that help us recognize and have some form of predictability in the world. But there's a designer and a maker who has the ultimate say and the ultimate coder in terms of deciding what will happen and when it will happen. And just because Allah allowed for there to be a predictability, doesn't mean that that entity has a will of its own. We like to treat the world as if it has a will of its own. That's how we like to see it. The world came to be, it just came to be. How? That's not important. It came to be. Maybe it came out of chance, and there are people who believe that. Really, you think all of this came out of chance? It's just is. So wh- wh- why, why is it just is? Why is it like this? The fine-tuning of the universe, all of these details, the, the amount of you know, synchrony that has to coexist at the same time for life to exist, we treat that as just arbitrary, it just happened, out of chance. Out of all the multiple possibilities, it just happened. And there are people, subhanAllah, these back, maybe things that the narrative is changing a bit. There are people who don't want to believe in one Allah. They struggle to believe in one Allah that is responsible for all this creation. But they're willing to believe in many, many, many parallel universes which they cannot see. I'm willing to believe in many parallel universes that will explain how this world came to be instead of believing in one Allah that I cannot see. So I'm willing to say that this world came into be because there are so many other parallel worlds and in many of those parallel worlds things didn't actually progress to the point where life was possible. But in our universe, in our reality, things progressed in a certain way out of chance where life became possible. So imagine it's like saying, there are, you know, all these infinite universes, yeah, that exist, and our universe happens to just be one of them, that happen to have the specific circumstances for life to exist, just come together randomly. So I don't want to believe in one Allah, 
that brought all of this into existence, which I cannot see, but I'm willing to believe in infinite universes or infinite realities that will explain how this reality is possible. You understand the irrationality, the contradiction here. You don't want to believe in one infinite creator, but you want to believe in many infinite realities to explain how life came to be. And that's why you'll see the Qur'an actually poke, poke at the, the, the other explanations for life and basically render them incoherent. That they're really incoherent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, either sama un fatara. And sama could, mean to, could refer to sky, and it could refer to everything that's above us, meaning the universe. The whole universe. So Allah is saying that the sky will in fatara. In fatara, the, elsewhere in the Quran, Allah says, Hal tara min futur. Do you see any cracks above you? And for those of you, subhanAllah, who are studying physics, you know, again, this is beyond the scope of our class, but it would be nice to see physicists break down these words, break down these ayat, and look at, subhanAllah, the different ayat in the Quran that talk about the end of the world. And the talk about the reality as exists. And the differences in the words that Allah uses. That's a study to be made. And there are those who tried in the past, but I think our modern students of physics and Quranic sciences have a lot more to contribute to this era and this area. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to the ayah, says, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فطرة. When the sky or the universe in fatara means to, it, it refers to the early stages of cracking. You know when you, when, you, uh, when you crack something, but only parts of it, only parts of it have fallen, but there's still, most of it is still intact. Versus, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ انشقت, انشقت refers to the cracking finally taking place and it breaks the whole entity. So look at the precision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah is talking about the early steps in that cracking. So what happens when the universe begins to crack? And the sky begins to crack? And everything above us begins to crack. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ تَثَرَتْ Now we have to be very uh, focused and subtle here because in the previous surah Allah talks about the planets but Allah uses the word نُجُوم نُجُوم Here He talks about the planets but He uses the word كَوْكَبْ What's the difference in a najm and a كَوْكَبْ? They both are same words that refer to celestial bodies but najm, najm comes from, it's usually associated with something that is very, um, that's very uh, fluorescent, that is very bright. So it captures the light, the light, it captures the radiance. Whereas kawkab captures the weight, the weight of these celestial objects. It captures the weight. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, earth, in the surah al taqweed He's talking about or referring to the light the nujum, as they basically scatter and crack and di they become dim. Here he's talking about the actual physical breaking. That when the universe begins to crack or the sky begins to crack, what will happen to these stars and planets and celestial objects, they will begin to fall apart. And the image that the Mufassirun use, if you look at Abu Hayyan and if you look at um, uh, Zanakhshari and Ar-Razi, and we take from Zanakhshari, his linguistic analysis, but we, t we don't take from his aqidah. Because he was a Mu'tazili, he, he was a rationalist, a pure rationalist. He denied and had some very you know, problematic beliefs. But the scholars still took from him, from his grammatical analysis. Now sh that shows you, it's very important to take a tangent here. You know, we live now in a world where we have this attitude of like, if somebody has a problem in their aqidah, don't study with them, don't listen to them, don't ever read them. But our classical scholars actually took from us the Even though he had a aqidah that was problematic. They said the linguistic analysis is very important, it's very useful. So that goes to show you that we as Muslims have to be what? Have to be cautious, yes, but we also have to be fair. In taking the good from whoever is contributing, as long as we have the criteria to decipher, and that's for the scholars to basically engage in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to the ayah, وَيْدَ الْكَوَاكِ بُنْتَثَرَ The classical scholars, they give this image of a tent. Imagine there's a tent. And the tent has lights. You know when you have those lights, strings, and you basically put them up. What happens when the tent begins to crack? And unf like it begins to basically unfold. It begins to basically break apart. You'll have those lights also do what? Begin to basically scatter, begin to fall. And if it happens so quickly and suddenly, 
that some of them may actually fall and break. So that's the image that they use to, un- to kind of capture what's being discussed here. That the universe somehow, it's like, imagine it's like a tent. The early scholars didn't understand how the universe is, is, is held up. They didn't understand the forces, dark matter, and it, they didn't understand any of those things. And some of us still don't. It's difficult to understand. But they're trying to get us to imagine that when these forces begin to crack and begin to weaken because Allah commands them to, the things that are being held in place, like the stars and the planets, will begin to crack and fall. They fall out of their orbits. So I can imagine all of this constancy that you see will begin to basically cease to be. And the planets will begin to orbit or exit their orbits and begin to scatter everywhere and begin to break. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting us to imagine that there's some connection between the universe and the forces and the planets and also between the seas that exist. Allah is making that clear that once this is happening, you also see on planet earth, the seas will begin to erupt out of their, out of their confinement like we discussed before. But here Allah mentions fujjara, that they will become explosive. They will become explosive. When we discussed some previous scholars actually thought that the whole world would eventually become one water body. The waters would eventually come out of their areas where they're confined and eventually cover the whole surface. You can read some of the notes here, some interesting reflections. Now this is where it begins to be very what? It begins to be very vivid. Very vivid. Allah is getting us to imagine the word here, it literally, um, it literally means to open something up and to flip it upside, inside out because you're looking for something. Imagine you have a, a suitcase or a bag and you lost your phone. So you're looking over and over again, you can't find your phone anywhere, so you take the bag, you flip it upside down to try to look for the phone inside, and then you, you, in doing so, you flip everything inside out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is getting us to imagine that these graves, al qubur where people are buried, will be flipped inside out. Like there will be nobody left untouched. Everybody will be brought out and that action of bringing people out is not like a smooth, you know, kind of like, okay, come. It's actually very what? It's very, for many people, it's very violent. It's very rough. It's very quick. It's very sudden. As all of this is happening, people are brought out of their graves. Are brought out of their graves. And the scholars here mention that every human being will go back to the form that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them in without any modifications. And they will be resurrected at the age of, these are again, ishtihadat from the scholars and based on the hadith that are attributed to the Prophet they will all be resurrected at the age of 33. So tattoos will be gone, piercings will be gone, anything that happened, you lost a finger, all of that will be restored. And you will be in the form that Allah created you on and in at the age of 33. And you'll be now getting ready and directed as we discussed before by the angels to go to the gathering place where the uh, account will take place. Very powerful. When this is happening, again, and we discuss these ads are reiterating concepts again and again because they're very powerful but important to understand. And you know when a teacher repeats something over and over again, it seems like, oh, it's so basic, but it's actually not. It's very important. And only when we understand it fully does it become what? Transmitted through our action. So the only time that Allah subhanahu wa like, ta'ala, the only time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or one of the reasons why Allah mentions something over and over again is because you think you understood it, but you haven't. You haven't fully understood it. So take the time to reread and read and read and read, and read it again and again. Allah says, at that moment, every nafs, every soul, every being will know what it has sent forward and what it has left behind. مَا قَدَّمَتْ وَأَخَّرَتْ Now this has multiple meanings. Imagine it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what you do in this life, you send it. You send it forward. Because imagine you're all writing, we're all writing our stories. And then we send those stories forward to the day of resurrection where they're going to be published. So like imagine you're working on a journal paper 
and then you submit that paper to the journal and then that paper is going to go through some processes and then it's eventually going to be published. When does your paper get published? On the day of resurrection. But in this world you're sending, you're sending, you're sending your story, you're sending your chapter ahead of time. That's, what it, that's one of the interpretation. And ma akharat what it has left behind. So all of us, we're presenting something forward and we're leaving things behind. Every single day. You have a decision to be made, to, to, to make. Are you going to do the halal? You decide to do the halal, you've chosen to pursue that as part of your story. And you say no to the haram, so you've put that behind you. So on that day, you will know in full details what you've decided to put behind you and what you've decided to focus on and what you've decided to pay forward and what you've decided to leave as a legacy in this dunya. Because you influence what is to come. And you also what you leave behind, what you choose not to focus on, becomes a part of the past. And others say qaddamat wa akharat here means what you chose to do from what Allah has commanded you to do and what you've chosen to ignore from what Allah has commanded you to do. So imagine here the commandments from Allah, you chose to act on one, two, three, four, five, so those are things you presented. And you chose to actually neglect one, two, three, four, five, so those are the things that you've put behind you. And the, ayah, the, the meaning of the, of the two words captures all of this. So imagine the language is so powerful that captures all of these meanings with the same words. So when the Arab audience of the Qur'an is listening to this, they're like, wow, every decision that I make is setting, deciding the steps to come. And then that is sent forward. And it's, it's going to be published. And what I choose to ignore and leave behind, that is also will be captured. And the hadith of the Nabi Sallam capture this in detail. This the Nabi Sallam tells us that every time we make the intention to do wrong, it is written down. And when we decide not to act upon it, we're, giving, we're given the reward for it. So how do you get a reward for something if it's not written down? It is written down. So imagine, you know sometimes people say, oh our intentions are not written down. Actually they are written down. When you intend to do something, and you act upon it, if it's good, you get the reward. And if you don't act upon it, if it's bad, you also get reward. So imagine all of this is captured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا قَدَّمَتْ وَأَخَّرَتْ and remember how the last surah, Surah Al-Takweer, had an amazing question. Uh, what was the question? فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you going? What are you deciding now? Here we have another amazing question. يَا أَيُّهَا الْإِنسَانُ مَا غَرَّكَ بِرَبِّكَ الْكَرِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا الْإِنسَانُ And we're going to discuss يَا أَيُّهَا in details in later surah because it's very grammatically important. But because of the time, we'll defer that to later. Al-Insan Insan is the word for human. But it comes from root words, two possibilities. One possibility is, insan comes from nasiya, which many grammars actually dismiss. Um, that it's not actually the same root. Nasiya means to forget, because the human being is a forgetful being. And insan comes from uns, which means the, the, to, to long for, for company. So the human being by nature is a, is a being that likes company is a being that likes to be with people. And because of that need for recognition, there's going to be a lot of vulnerability that comes from that. So a shaitan will actually use that nature against you. Get you to do certain things that are not really uh, conducive to your honor and integrity to get that attention, to get that aff affection, to get the affirmation from people. So insan literally means the being which loves affirmation, which loves affection, which loves other people, and which likes the attention of other people, which likes to give attention to other people. So, Ya Ayyuhal Insan, with this being, imagine Allah speaking to you directly in the Quran, after all these things that are described in reality happening, towards the day of resurrection, on the day of resurrection, Allah gives each and every one of us a question. Ma gharraka? Gharra comes from the root gharra. And gharab is to mislead, to deceive, to, to, to expose yourself to danger, to risk, to jeopardize one's life and to be blind. Those are all associated with the word. So Sifat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what made you blind? Towards your Rabb. Rabb indicates a relationship, your creator, your sustainer, al kareem 
the one who's so generous to you, the one who's so honorable to you. So what has made you deceived and blind or emboldened or what has made you choose to overlook the generosity of your Lord, the nobility of your Lord? What does this mean? It means subhanAllah that we look at Allah's generosity and kindness and we take that for granted. So the fact that Allah doesn't punish us right away, instead of, us, instead of it making us grateful, what we say is, look, I did something bad and nothing happened. Look, I cheated, nothing happened. Where are the thunderbolts? Where is the punishment? Where is this? Where is that? So Allah is saying here, what has made you misunderstand the generosity of your Lord as ignorance? As unawareness. Why do, you, why do you think to yourself that because Allah hasn't punished you, it's because He doesn't know. No, He knows. But He's giving you chances. He's giving you a chance to repent. A chance to rethink. A chance to recenter yourself. So what has emboldened you? What has given you the authority? Or what has deceived you? To misreading the forgiveness of Allah and the forbearance of Allah with you as his being ignorant of what you're doing. You know, imagine if Allah were to punish us every single time that we did wrong. Or imagine if Allah were to basically allow our sins, instead of them being written in a book of deed that is kept private, and given us a chance to correct that, imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed our sins to be published on our faces. Imagine, I, imagine you see me or I see you, and then the sin that you've committed become what? Become visible. And the scholars say, imagine that sin had an odor. You could smell someone's sin. None of us would want to talk to any of us. Because we're all sinners. Nobody would, nobody would have the audacity to go out in public. But out of rahmah, Allah chose to put that private and to give us a chance to have dignity and to walk with dignity amongst one another and to give us a chance to repent and to refix and to reassess. But we take that for granted and we think to ourselves, ah, I got away with it. If Allah was there, He would have punished me. If you're there, why don't you punish me right now? Show me the sign. Right? And, and subhanAllah, it's, it's out of ignorance that you're asking to be punished. Like the Arabs, this is what they were saying to Rasulullah Anzalayna. Uh, or kisa uh, min sana send all like uh, send the striking punishment from above. Or why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa taala send the angels right now to end it? For okay. so, we're ready. Where is the punishment that you're promising us? So imagine they're saying, if you think if you want us to believe in your Lord, why don't you send the punishment now? The ignorance, the arrogance. And out of rahmah, Allah says, I'm not going to punish you now. I'm going to give you chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to repent and to turn back to Him. This is so important. This ayah is so important. Never think that Allah is blind. The ayah in Surah Ibrahim says, Don't ever think that Allah is unaware of what people do. He's given every one of them a time that they will stand in front of Allah to answer for what they're doing. So just because Allah deferred the meeting with you to a time that comes later, doesn't mean you take advantage of that. Every single sin you'll have to answer for, either in this dunya or in the akhirah. So don't take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granted. And don't take the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granted. And don't take the nobility. Allah is noble. Allah is not going to be, you know, impacted by your sin here and there. But out of Allah's justice is that everything will have to be paid for. Every person that you've hurt. Every person that you've lied to. Every truth that you misrepresented or manipulated. Every right that you've robbed someone else of. Every hurt that you've caused, every tear that you've caused someone to shed, every single act that you've presented into this world, and every single decision that you've made to turn an invitation to wrong, you have to answer it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
one way or the other. Either you're going to be cleansed from it in this dunya through punishment. Either you're going to be cleansed from it in the grave through punishment. And those are the lesser of the punishments. Or either you're going to have to be exposed to Jahannam until you've set and cleared your bath because Allah is just and fair. In the Akhirah, you're going to have to answer for it. And that's why we make the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, allow us to enter Jannah without an account. Because if any of us were to be held accountable and be asked, that's it. We'll all be doomed. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to treat us with His forgiveness, not only His justice. Because if Allah were to treat all of us with His justice only, none of us would make it to Jannah. Not a single one of us. They said to Rasul Sallam, even you, Ya Rasulullah, he said, even me. Unless Allah were to shower me with his mercy, I myself would not even be able to, out of my own, attain the salvation or the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't take advantage of that mercy. And don't think that it's going to be deserved. And don't think it's going to be guaranteed. You know, some people actually convince themselves. You know, subhanAllah, I... I I'm going to take a tangent here, subhanAllah. Uh, recently, and when I mention this example, Wallahi, I don't mean any dis- disrespect to the person or to the people that I'm discussing. I'm fo- focusing on the idea, not on the people. And this is something that we can all fall into. But I had a conversation with a brother, may Allah bless him, a good brother, kind and generous. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed this person with so much wealth. And this person began to think to himself that Allah has been so good to me, so good to me. And we have this special bond with Allah. Like I've reached the position with Allah where we're really on like very tight terms. Right? MashaAllah, great. And this person asked me a question. He says, and you know, subhanAllah, it's like, it's so easy to convince yourself of this Zulu spirituality. You know, I'm so close to Allah. I pray in my own way. I have this special bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this person asked me a question. This person said, Do you know the difference between a Muslim and a Mu'min? The difference between a Muslim and a believer? Uh, of course, I'm, I'm interested. I'm like, what is the difference? He's like, it's none of the stuff that they teach you in the universities or Al-Azhar or Medina or these mullahs. You know, those mullahs who talk too much. It's none of that. I'll tell you in very simple words. Like, okay, what's the difference? It's like a Muslim is someone who listens to Allah. But a believer, a mu'min, is someone that Allah listens to. Like, mashallah, sounds so nice. Sounds really nice, yeah? And actually, you can make a good case from the Quran and the Sunnah. Like the Prophet says, there are people that are so close to Allah and they're so unknown to people. If Allah were to ask them for anything, if they were to ask Allah for anything, Allah would give it to them. Because they have a special bond with Allah. So I recognize that some people have that bond. But then when it came time to pray, this person, yeah, I, I, I don't do that. You don't do that. I'm, I'm tight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? Like, you peasants, you have to do these basic things, yeah, prayer and uh, those outward things. You have to do those things to have this relationship with Allah. I'm not saying this out of arrogance, but I stopped doing those things a long time ago. And Allah is still giving and providing and loving and showing and taking care of me. And Allah is giving me this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and this because I have other ways. You know, there are people who need, to, who need these rules to, to, to get to a point. But once you get to that point, your heart begins to flour, like, flourish with love. And you don't need these things anymore. Do you understand how shaitan can trick you? And this is mentioned in Surah Al-Fajr. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَا بَتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمَهُ وَنَعَمَهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّ أَكْرَمًا when Allah tests you by giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and being so generous with you, instead of saying, Ya Allah, I don't deserve any of this. I have done nothing to deserve it. Ya Allah, I'm worried about this. Ya Allah, allow me to use it for good. I should be more grateful. Like what Allah told us, 
Allah has inna fatahna laka fatah mubina liyaghfira laka Allah ma taqaddama min dhambika wa ma taakhir wa yutumma ni'matu alayka wa hadika salata mustaqima Allah has forgiven you what's come in the past and what's to come in the future and Allah will give you victory and listen, listen now when Allah revealed the words to the Prophet sallam, what did he do? He stood in qiyam longer to thank Allah He didn't say out of everybody the Prophet Muhammad sallam is the only one in the Qur'an that is given that assurance, everything you're go- you've done in the past, small, smallest, all of it is cleansed. All of it is cleansed. And Allah has gra- guaranteed you victory. Prophet Muhammad could have said, okay, I paid my dues. All those years of heart sacrifice, alhamdulillah, paid off. Time to chill. Time to retire from worship. Time to focus on something else. Time to focus on giving, being kind to people. I have that relationship with Allah, it's secure, we're good. So now it's time for me to invest in my relationship with people. That's what, that is how people, some people think subhanAllah. And it's so sad, it's so sad because a lot of time, a lot of the time, people convince themselves that they have this special bond with Allah. But what gives you that assurance? Because you have these feel good moments, that you somehow feel that you have this special bond where you, where you don't have to show gratitude to Allah by doing the things that He's told you to do. Did you see that how shaitan tricks us? It's like, you know, I, I, I actually, yeah, I understand salah and this and that, but you don't understand how spiritual my heart is. It's so full of love. It's like when I read the Quran, it brings tears to my eyes and I have this really, really special bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, I know, I, I drink from time to time. I don't wear the hijab, right? Or I, I, I know I have a girlfriend or I'm doing this. I, but it's okay, it's like, it's like, you know, I have this bond, I haven't lost it yet. So I'm okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay in this state. So people tell themselves all these narratives. What makes you think that that special feeling that you have in Qiyam is because you have, a, you have spirituality? What if it's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah can test you by giving you the taste of Iman. To see, are you going to be grateful by doing? And Allah can take away the taste of Iman to see, are you chasing the high or are you looking for Him? Does that make sense? Imagine you pray, Allahu Akbar, and you pray, 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 and you don't feel anything. So are you going to stop because you can't find that sweetness? Are you chasing the high, or are you, che- or, or are you chasing the all high, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most high? Does that make sense? And when Allah takes that sweetness, or gives you that sweetness, it could be a test. There's no assurances. Allah didn't send you guarantee saying, you have iman. Good job. 8 out of 10. So if Allah gives you this special feeling, if you want to say, then follow it with what? The outward. The outward commitment. Islam is both an outward commitment to law and an inward lived experience. Both need to be hand in hand. And nobody has guarantees. Nobody has guarantees. And sometimes shaitan will do this like gharar. Shaitan will deceive you. By whispering that the good feeling that you have is your assurance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But nobody has assurance. So we all have to continue to treat ourselves as absolutely flawed and absolutely, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in a state of despair in an insan al khus until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He decides our fate and He judges us. He judges us, right? So, Ya Ayyuhal Insanu, Ma Harraka Bi Rabbika Al Kareem, Your Lord who's providing, taking care of you. Rabb focuses on the things that He does for you. He continues to give because He loves to give. Not because He deserves it, because He loves to give. And because He's noble, He's generous. Alladhi Khalaqaka, the one who created you. Fasawwaka, and He, like Taswiya, Taswiya means what? To give you a form, to give you a to give you a uh, physical appearance and to give you some form of what? Some form of, um, you know, some, some form of fashion, like a fashion. So, خَلَقَكَ He created you, فَسَوَّاكَ And then He fashioned you, فَعَدَلَكَ عَدَلَكَ means what? عَدَلَكَ comes from عَدِل, to balance, to give you balance, to give you some form of symmetry, to give you some equilibriums in your life. You know this ayah is so powerful. You can write so much on this ayah. Now let's take a let's take a one of the one of the many benefits. Notice that Allah uses the fa. 
Fa indicates stages, that it happens in stages. And fa also indicates sequence, or it indicates level of blessing. Like it, it basically indicates, this it indicates level of importance, or it indicates a sequence. So it's either, either a top down in terms of most important to less important, or less important to most important, or this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. So I ate, and then I drank, and then I had dessert. Fa, fa, fa. Or, make sure you do your homework, and then play, you know, some games, and then get some rest. So, meaning like, in terms of importance, prioritization. Or in terms of sequence, fa serves those functions. So those who say it takes a sequence, they understand as a sequence, they actually use it to suggest that there are steps in the creation of the human being. The first Allah created the human as a soul. Then Allah gave the human a form. Then Allah gave the human balance in that form. That the human being wasn't created all in one go. And yet in the Quran are many. There are, you know, stages. So they use this actually to say that, yeah, you can make a case for evolutionary biology, like the evolution of the human being in stages based on this ayah. Is this possible? Allah Alam. But we don't want to superimpose scientific realities on the Quran. We want to say that it's a possibility, it's one of the readings, but it's not the only reading. You can't, and this is the problem, yeah, we cannot superimpose scientific realities on Quranic realities. Because Quranic realities are not fixed in a time and space, they're eternal. But scientific ones are quick to change across time and space. So what we accept now to be true may change a hundred years from now. So if we say this is, the, this is what the ayah means based on understanding now, what happens 500 years down the line when our scientific progress becomes more fine and we realize that what we know now is nothing? So we can't say that this is what the ayah means because our science changes and we get better and better in understanding. And that's why when speaking about the Qur'an, we don't say that this is what Allah says. Who knows? We can't ever say that. Some ayat are clear, yeah. We're talking about the ambiguous ones, yeah. Or the ayat that have multiple layers of meanings. We don't want to use the word ambiguous because the Qur'an is specific. It's our understanding that may not be specific based on what we know. We have limitations in knowing. The Qur'an is precise in expression. It's infinite. But we are limited in our ability to internalize the infinity because we're finite beings. So the finite is trying to understand the infinite. Right? So, there's that way to read it. Or the, way to, the other way to read it is importance. Not, like the best gift that He gave is the gift of life. But He didn't just create you and made you like a, a, you know, a, just, just a, an entity that is sitting there without choice, without will, without agency. He didn't make you into a small, unimportant, unintelligent entity. No, He gave you form. And He gave you balance in that form. Balance, imagine the feelings that we have. Right? The, 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 the love, the ability to give, to desire, to be... All of those things that Allah has ingrained in us, they come from somewhere. Imagine subhanAllah, yani, the, like a baby. A baby who's just born. The mother will take that baby and place the baby on her chest and the baby will know what to do. Will begin to suckle. Where does that come from, subhanAllah? Where does that fitrah come from? Where does that natural instinct comes from? So we, we, think, we think that we're in, we're in control, right? We, have, like we think we, we attribute will to ourselves, but there's so much encoded in us that we cannot explain. Our ability to, to mimic language, our ability to understand, our ability to love. Nobody teaches you how to love. You see it. If you grow up in a, a loving society, and the minute, subhanAllah, that you, you, you have this halal relationship, you know what to do. You feel like it's, it's a natural part of you. Where does that come from? That's all part of Allah giving us that balance. The balance between wanting to receive and wanting to give. The balance between, you know, wisdom. The balance between also humility and not knowing. The balance between eloquence but also knowing where our limitations are. We all have this balance, right? And also physical balance. Imagine, imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have put you in charge of your own growth. He could have put you in charge of your own growth. Or He could have put you in charge of your own breathing and in your own heart rate. So you forget to breathe, you die. 
You get into a heated debate, a conversation, you forget to breathe, you die. Or, you, or imagine you put you in charge of growing, so you're so focused on growing your right side that you forget your left side. Right? It's an image that's funny, right? But it, that's what Allah is saying here, that who gave you that balance? Who, gave, who put in you all of these things that happen naturally? Where did it come from? الَّذِي خَلَقَكَ فَسَوَّاكَ فَعَدَلَكَ And it's also recited as فَعَدَّلَكَ He made you moderate. He made you up, upright. Or فَعَدَّلَكَ He molded you and your features in a beautiful form. He did not make you unattractive. This will be reiterated again in Surah uh, At-Teen. لَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We've created the human being in the best form. It's a beautiful story. I'm sure you've heard me say, some of you have heard me say, say this before. But I, I, I personally like this story because it teaches us to have self-respect and it teaches us to have, again, to overcome insecurities about ourselves based on the standards of society that, is, that are constructed within a time and space. What is the story? It happens at the time of Abu Ja'far al mansur There's a husband and a wife who just got married. Just got married. And they're, you know, it's their honeymoon day, the first night of their relationship. They're so excited. There's all this chemistry, there's all this love and infatuation, and, you know, all this amazing energy. So they're holding each other's hands, and they're going for a walk. And the moon is fully bright, fully full. And subhanAllah, it's a dark night, the moon is radiant. And the guy looks at his wife's face, and the moon is right behind. And he says to her, you're so beautiful, MashaAllah, you're so gorgeous, you're the most beautiful woman in the world, you're the most beautiful woman in the universe. And then he goes and saying, I, in my eyes, you are the most beautiful creation ever. Actually, you are more beautiful than the moon. And for Arabs, the moon was like the height of beauty, because everything else is dark, it shines, it gives you that glow, it directs your travel at night, it steers you, it, it's, it's beautiful. So he says to her, I swear, you're more beautiful than the moon. And of course she's like, stop it. You know, right? You know, sisters, they, some, of course, uh, it could be genuine. Please don't, don't say that. Or it could be like, you know, you're fishing for more, you know, compliments. So she's like, stop. He's like, no, no, seriously, you are more beautiful than the moon. And she's like, no, please don't say that. He's like, no, no, I'm certain. I am so certain that I'm willing to divorce you, to divorce you, to divorce you. Three times, it's a final divorce. If the moon is more beautiful than you. So she drops his hand and she says, you can't touch me. We're no longer husband and wife because you've just divorced me. You've given me a final talaq. Because I don't think I'm more beautiful than the moon. You need to get, a, you need to get proof. You need to get a fatwa from the scholars to prove that I'm more beautiful than the moon before you can touch me again. So this miskeen on his wedding night, he has to leave his wife drop her off home and he has to go to the masjid and he has to wait until fajr time because you're not going to go knock on the shaykh's door at 2 a.m. to ask him, shaykh, can I get a fatwa that my wife is more beautiful than the moon? <laughs> He's going to smack you, yeah? Some, some community, alhamdulillah, the Mississauga community is nice when it comes to this, you know, we respect boundaries. But other communities where I have, you know, lived, seriously, people will knock, you know, Shaykh Abdullah will tell you, people knock on his door at 2, 3 a.m. You know, certain communities in Hamilton, certain communities knocking door at 2, 3 a.m. to ask you some of the most love for Hamilton. Yeah, deep respect, mashallah. <laughs> every, every community has its goods and some limitations, yeah. So, they, they will knock to ask some of the, subhanAllah, serious questions. So he has to wait until Fajr. To wait until Fajr. And uh, shiukh are coming in. So he goes to, you know, one of the shiukh and he asks, by the way, this is what happened. What do you think? And then he has to say to him, listen, this is so interesting, let me bring the rest of the chair. Like this needs to sit down. All of us need to hear this. <laughs> you know? So they gather all the shiuch, young and old, and tell us the story again. Please do tell us what happened. So he mentioned the story again. And then the, the, the older shiuch, you know, senior shiuch, I mean, may Allah bless them, but they've seen a lot in life. So you know, you know when you're young, Little, little will get you excited. But when you've seen life, like khalas, you're just sitting there like, just another crazy situation, right? So one of the senior shiuch, he looks at him, he's like, man, why, why would you say that? Why would you say that? Like, how, how could you say that the moon is more beautiful than 
you know, your wife, you got too carried away, you know what, the divorce is final, just, just go. Like you need to spend some time emotionally regulating yourself. Right? But then, there was a young scholar, some say he was a student of Imam Abu Hanifa, or from the Hanafi Madha, and he says to the Shu, actually wait a second, no, he has a right to say that. Because Allah mentions in Surah Al-Teen, لَقَدْ خَلَقَنَ الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ We have created the human in the best. Ahsan means ultimate best form. So the form of the human is better than any other creation. So if your wife is a human, regardless of how she looks, if she's a human, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not giving a subjective answer. We're giving an objective categorical answer. If she's a human, by the mere fact that she's a human, she's better looking than any of the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So go back and tell her, you are the most beautiful in the universe, you're more beautiful than the sun and the moon and the batik and the shaman, whatever you want, because she is. So he goes back and he's so excited, he's like, guess what? I got the fatwa, we're still married, you know, they live happily ever after. But the idea here, subhanAllah, is Allah created us and Allah tells us from an objective lens, not a subjective lens, that we're in the best form. We're in the best form. If you, if you, if you look at, and here's subhanAllah, you know, a little bit of a tangent. If you look at attraction, attraction, what is considered to be attractive, that has evolved across time and space. It has evolved across time and space. So in certain parts of the world, even now, not even just in the past, to be, for example, uh, to, to have a high fat percentage of body, like fat body percentage, or body fat percentage, that was considered to be what? It was considered to be very attractive, especially in scarcity situations. Because it shows that you have money, that you can afford to eat. You're not living off of like, you know, uh, you're not a vegan, a vegan yeah? you're eating, eating meat and you're eating you know, lamb and chicken. That was considered to be in parts of the world. And in other parts of the world, you know, basically to have like a slim and a slender body is considered to be more attractive because it indicates that you take care of yourself, that you, you know, you ascribe, that you're, you're working out, you're exercising, that you're active. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a form of fitness, right? And of course, evolutionary biology will have explanations for both. And uh, SubhanAllah, but at the end of the day, there are, attract, attraction is constructed socially. You know, like certain body uh, piercings or art uh, expressions are considered to be very attractive in certain societies and considered to be hideous in others. And there's a lot of, you know, cultural tropes about this that exist in every part of the world. And people mock fun and, you know, make fun of each other all the time. Um, SubhanAllah, when it comes to this. But at the end of the day, even if you look at fashion, if you look at fashion, you know, 40 years, 50 years ago, like, what are these guys wearing? What, what are you doing? Like, what happened? I'm sure people will look back at us, you know, 60, 70, 80 years, and like, what, what, you, what is that? What are you wearing? So all these things are subject to change. But the one objective lens, or the one objective source that doesn't change, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah Himself says He created you in the best form, don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Right? And now we are, subhanAllah, in a... In a in a, a, a space where that's become the, the, the mainstream opinion. Everybody is beautiful, you know, affirmation, affirm all forms of expressions, and you know, now we even have to represent, to be representative, to represent those bodies in specific, you know, mediums and in expressions, and even in modeling, we have plus size this. SubhanAllah, imagine, imagine as society goes through this extreme, remember the dialectic? We go through this dialectic, back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure it out. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already gave us the balance. So I have given you the balance. I have put it inside you. How do you keep it? How do you maintain it? How do you cultivate it? By doing what? لِمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يستقيم In the last surah. For whoever wills from you to hold on to this path, to take this path that is straight, to take this path that is balanced. And then he tells us, في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك. You know, it's important that Allah mentions the reason why you should obey Him is because He's the one that created you, and He's the one that fashioned you, and He's the one that gave you the balance that you have. You know, when you create something, we gave this example before. ألا له الخلق والأمر. 
The reason why Allah is the only one that has the right to tell you what to do is because He's the one that created you. If you create, yani imagine the minute, this is, this is so important, and I mentioned this before, but just for reiteration. If I go to a store and I buy this laptop, I become the owner of the laptop even though I didn't make it. I don't own the production rights. I own the use, the usage rights. So I, I own the ability, I have the right to use it. Now, if this laptop starts work, stops working, first of all, who decides what this laptop is going to be used for? The creator sets specific parameters, but the user sets what to use it for. So I can use it to do, you know, to mine Bitcoin. Not making a fatwa, Allah Alam. That's besides the scope. I'm not saying Bitcoin is halal, okay? Or you can use it to, you know, play video games. Or you can use it to stream. Uh, you know, uh, to, to basically uh, stream illegal content, copyrighted content. You can use it to research. You decide what to use it for. And if that use is no longer being, if your needs are no longer being met by the laptop, what do you do? When the iPhone, you know, the latest iPhone comes out, what do you do to the old iPhone? Khalas, you, you discard it, you sell it, you do with it whatever you want. Because you're the user. What about the creator who made that thing? What about if you're the creator and the one that's in charge of sustaining this thing? You get to tell this entity what to do, when to do, and you get to decide when this entity is done and when this entity is no longer useful, and when this entity is no longer meeting its specific, like the specific goals that you've set for it. We have to remember that we are creation. Allah is the one who made us. Allah is the one who made us. Allah is the only one who deserves and has that so right to tell us what to do. في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك. He could have put you in any fashion, in any illustration, in any image, in any likeness, in any likeness. Right? في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك. كلا بل تكذبون بالدين. You indeed, as human beings. Continue to deny this final judgment. You continue to live in denial, in gharab, in thinking, yeah, I'm okay, I'm, I'm, I'm fine where I am, I don't need to believe, I don't need to believe in anything bigger than that, I'm, I'm okay. So you continue to deny the final account. Now what does deen mean by the way? Deen comes from the root word dana. Dana, dan alif noon. Yadin, madyun, madin. So those are all related words. And it basically, dana is to, to do what? It's to basically have a, it's to, it's to basically be loaned something that will be taken back. And that accounting, that final accounting is when we exchange the balance or everything is restored. That's basically called, you know, the, the dain, the final account. And that's where the word loaning comes from. When you take a loan from someone. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you are denying the day in which all the balances are cleared. So the balances will not be fully cleared until that day, from the root of the word. No balance will ever be fully clear until that day. There are so much good that people do that will go unrecognized. I was just thinking of that today, subhanAllah. You know the, how many of you, let's just do this actually. How many of you noticed that the minbar of the masjid has just been given a fresh coat of paint? How many of you noticed? Uh, MashaAllah. So there are more hands on the sister's side even though the sisters are further. Sisters pay attention more. Okay, interesting. But, and we just had what, like five hands, three hands out of, you know, 150? How many of you could guess the number of times that that member had to be coated? How many of you can guess? Yeah? Go ahead. Seven? Seven? Okay, good guess. Three or two, yeah, good guesses. How many of you know the person that quoted it? You know the person that quoted it. Only one person does. Two. Who is it? I'm going to test it, see if you do. Yeah? Who is it? Hmm? Sorry? Allah quoted the minbar. <laughs> Allah is the one who allowed for the minbar to be quoted. Yeah, no, <laughs> stop from Allah. Now may Allah bless you. Jazakumullah khair. How old are you? You're 11. You have to think about it there. Yeah, inshallah. That's good. So, it's actually one of our brothers here. Brother Ilyas. 
Brother Ilyas has been serving this institution for like more than 20 years. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. And if you think about the number of times that he has, you know, just subhanAllah, not even, like not even any recognition, any awareness from anyone. There's something that needs to be fixed. He fixes it. A few days ago, some of the kids broke one of the walls, damaged it. Fight happened, one kid threw another kid, it broke. Nobody had to tell him. Same day, a few hours later, comes, fixes it, patches it up, coat after coat, fixes it. Tables that break, chairs that break, things that get this. SubhanAllah, and here's an example of one person working behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And these are the people, SubhanAllah, that yani, Allah has, has put love in my heart for people like this because they don't, they don't like the spotlight, they don't like the attention, nobody knows, they don't care about that. They're just there to get the work done and to not make any noise about it. And those are beautiful people, SubhanAllah, Allah has put beauty in their hearts. Other people, to do the smallest little thing, they will make a big deal. Send an email. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my brothers and sisters. I was just looking, mashallah, the other day and I noticed that the mimbar is broken and ta, 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 ta. this is unacceptable, this is not appropriate, this is an institution of this magnitude and this size. How can we ignore these things? Ta, ta, ta. Who is in charge? Please give me the number. I need to speak to them immediately. I need to remind them of why we should invest in our masajid and you have a million dollars in your bank account and you cannot spend $200 on a coat of paint. Astaghfirullah. May Allah guide you and all of you. I have had it, you know, with ta, ta, ta. subhanAllah, you know? And if you cannot do it, I am ready to do it myself. Even if I have to learn how to cope, I know I have access to YouTube channels. Here's the link to the YouTube. Uh, how to actually paint it. It takes no, like anybody can do it. Making a big dramatic scene out of nothing. There are people like that. MashaAllah. So, going back to the ayah, so many balances are never going to be cleared until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much good that is not recognized. So much evil that no one knows about. This is not to scare you. Not to scare you. And you can definitely come to the Imams for counseling. We have confidentiality. We will not you know, use anything that you say against you. But I jokingly, laughingly, laughingly, yeah? I tell my wife, jokingly, that I really hope one day I'm not held at gunpoint and told to give the secrets of the community because the amount of things that you see behind the scenes لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله enough blackmail on every single family in Mississauga, Hamilton, you know, Stony Creek you name the city, you name the city everything comes to us unfortunately we don't need, it's come to a point now like please just I don't want to hear anyone, it's too much I'm a walking liability خلاص yeah so much wrong that goes unaddressed that cannot be addressed because there's no infrastructure in place there are structural limitations like imagine the, the best example imagine someone who kills a thousand people every one of those lost lives has a right to retribution but what's the worst that we can do to that person kill them once right the worst that we can do Capital punishment. And even then, some people have reservations when it comes to that. But what about all those other rights that have gone ignored? That have gone unnoticed? So who has the capacity to bring somebody account over and over and over and over again for eternity until that balance is fully cleared? And who has that right to be able to assure that with justice and wisdom? And who has that right to be able to balance between the vengeance but also the rahmah? Who's able to read the person's intention and judge what state they were in and what circumstances led them to be where they are? And who's able to assess the veracity of their claims and assess the truth of the testimony and assess the reality of what the witnesses have to say? So you deny this day of balance clearing when it's a reality. When it's a necessity, that like nothing makes sense without this. Existence would become meaningless without this. Because there's so much that we can get away with in this dunya, and there's so much good that will go unappreciated in this dunya. 
So, kalla ba'tu kadibuna bil-deen. Now listen to this, the beautiful transition. Wa inna alaykum lahafidheen. Wa inna alaykum lahafidheen. But we have put, we have put over you, like hafidheen is the plural of hafid, and hafid means somebody who's there to protect things from being lost. Like the Quran, the person who memorizes it is called the hafid because they keep it preserved. They protect it from loss. They protect it from it being basically what? Rendered unknown, unrecognizable to the people. So the hafid is someone who protects, someone who basically prevents something from being lost. So Allah has sent, has placed over you, who are these hafid? In the angels that will make sure everything is protected, everything is answered for. Every little deed, your rights are protected. They're assured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your actions are preserved. The good is going to be protected. The wrong is going to be preserved eventually to be held accountable. To be held accountable for. Who are these hafilin? Kiraman katibin. The angels are being described again here. Who are they? Kiraman. They're noble as well. Kiraman. They're honorable. High-minded. Noble-hearted. These are some of the meanings of the word. Precious. Katibin. Now katibin is in the present form. They're always writing. Constantly writing. So they don't take breaks. They're not like us needing breaks. They're consistently writing everything. Now why has Allah mentioned that the, the angels are noble? Kiraman. What is it like when you go and you think of somebody that's, you know, imagine you're going to a court and the person describes the judge as a noble judge. This is a noble judge. What does that mean? They're not going to misrepresent. They're not going to be biased. They're not going to be prejudiced. They're not going to be bribed. Like the Quraysh, they think everything, they see everything in money. Oh, we'll just slide some money under the table to the angels. We'll make it, we'll cut a deal. These angels don't need you. You can't make, you can't cut deals with them because they're noble. They're honorable. They're dignified. They don't need you. They don't need anything from you. And they're not there to basically hurt you either. Because they have dignity and nobility. They're there to write things as they are. And to give you a chance to fix and to rectify. And as we mentioned, some of them cheer you on. Questions later, inshallah. Some of them will cheer you on, exciting you to do good. Kiram and katibir, ya'lamuna ma tafa'loon. They know everything that you do. إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ Allah reiterates again. إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ إِنَّ is for tawkeed or ta'keed. Meaning, absolutely without doubt, أَبْرَارَ from the word بَارَارَ which means devout, pious, godly, upright, righteous, kind. Those who are righteous, kind, upright, they're already لا indicates it's already happened. Fi indeed, they are in bliss. Na'in comes from ni'ma, ni'uma, softness, blessing, um, you know, uh, tranquility. They're experiencing the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already. What does that mean? It's as if Allah is saying, those who choose the path of righteousness, for sure they're going to be given blessing, and it's so guaranteed that it's as if it's already happened. We discussed this before. Or, it's as if they're already experiencing a share of Jannah. You know, yesterday we had the Qiyan, and you know, I was praying behind uh, one of the, the shuf that was leading. And subhanAllah, for you know, the first time in a long time, I'm just sharing something personal here. Uh, you know, that, that sweetness of being in Qiyan is so beautiful, it's so powerful. I was just thinking to myself, how could anyone say no to this? How could anyone say no to this real form of pleasure that cannot be put in words? You know, every other form of pleasure in this dunya is so temporary. And even every other pleasure is, is like, it comes, with, is, it comes with a cost. It's not absolutely pure. It's not absolutely sweet. Like, you know, it, it might compromise your dignity or your integrity, it might get you to feel inferior or insecure. Every other form, or it might be temporary. It's like the sun, like it's every other form of pleasure is mixed with like a, like it, it comes with a cost. Either vivid, manifest, or subtle. 
But the pleasure of being connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is so pure. Like it is so pure. And I remember subhanAllah, one of the most transformative moments in my life has been, and I'm getting just from, to get us to, to be excited about this because it's a gift, it's a ni'mah. Was in Hajj, in Hajj, in, um, in Umrah, one of the times that I prayed with behind Sheikh Bandar Balila, may Allah bless him and preserve him. It was so powerful. Like as if nothing in this dunya mattered. You reach this height, height of sweetness and iman where you really love Allah for Allah. You get to a point where, like, I don't, Ya Allah, I am ready to meet you where you tell me to be met. No, I'm not coming with anything, no entitlement, nothing. It's like as if everything is, is, is stripped. You know, imagine, imagine all, this, all this filth, jealousy, envy, hatred, enmity, noise, wrong, all of it is gone. And the, the one thing that you have that is transcendent is this powerful connection you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm sure many of you, the reason why you're here studying the Qur'an is because you felt this in some way. Either in Ramadan, or in Hajj, or Umrah, or either you know, in Qiyam, at night between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you felt that moment of purity. And when you compare that to everything else, it's nothing. Nothing. Nothing can compare. So Allah is saying, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِينَعِينَ Those who commit to this path of righteousness, they will experience the ni'mah. Which is why Imam Al-Ghazali, he says something very beautiful. He says, no rational argument could be sufficient to get you to believe in Allah. Every rational argument will have a counter-argument, 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 counter-argument. And he says, Imam Al-Ghazali was brilliant. He says, I took every argument to its end. You know when you take an argument, well, well you could say this, and you could say this. So he would take that argument, and he would go for like 50, 60, 100, argument, counter-argument, argument, argument da, 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 da. and then after a while he's like, this is useless. This is useless. Hmm? Because it's not, it's not ever going to be sufficient. Your mind is not ever going to be sufficient to go towards the end, to get to the end. It's just ongoing. So he came to the conclusion that rationality helps you understand the basics, but doesn't get you there. He says what gets you there is experiencing Allah. Once you experience Allah, it becomes what? It becomes an empirical reality. It's an experienced reality. Khalas, you've, you've, you've felt it. You've witnessed it. Can anybody ever convince you that your mother is not real? No, I know my, I know my, what do you mean my mother is not real? Are you crazy? I know my mom. Can anybody tell you that, you know, your, your, whatever experience you have, can anybody convince you that that is wrong, that that is not real, that it didn't exist? Nobody can take that away from you. So it's not like Islam doesn't say you have to suspend your rationality to believe. No. Islam says everything that you believe in will be rational. But rationality is not enough. For every rationality, there's a counter argument and a counter rationality. And now we're coming to realize this, right? There are multiple rationalities and there are multiple perspectives and you know relativism and even multiple morality. Like human beings are coming to realize that when we ground something in logic, it's not sufficient. Because logic is not as powerful and as constant as we thought it was. And we think it is. Because, because it's still filtered, or maybe let me say it this way, logic as we perceive it, and as we re-articulate it, right? That there is a logos, there is a reality there, there's a truth. But that truth with a capital T is not ours to construct, nor is it ours to claim. It's Allah's to construct, and us to accept it from Him. That is the truth with a capital T. Everything else is humanly constructed. Every other form of ism will be limited to a time, to a space. But what is truth with a capital T is what Allah articulates, what Allah delivers, what Allah reveals. And that's why the Quran we believe is what is eternal. Because it's not constructed in a time and space. Yes, some of the rules come from the time and space, but the grander, the greater teachings and values and morals and ethics of the Qur'an and the Qur'an as a whole becomes eternal in its ability to guide. So those are the ones who commit to this righteousness. They will feel it, they will live it. It becomes a lived experience. But those who are weak, like fujjah, comes from fajara. We explain that it means to explode. Those who are explosive in their sins, those who really go out, 
are out of the way to do wrong. Lafi, they're already experiencing Jaheem. Jaheem means hellfire, but Jaheem, as we discussed, it's that look, you know that when a lion stares into your eyes, and you're looking back with fear and intimidation, the word is used, the root of the word is used. So it's like as if hell is already staring them in the eye, and because of that stare, they're what? They're turbulent. Like fujar, imagine the word fujar. It's like, you know, it's like, um, you know when, uh, when you think, think of particles. When particles are heated, and when entropy is high, what are those particles doing? They're moving. They're moving. So they're, they're not settled. So it's as if Allah SWT is giving us this image of an, an barara. Barara, it's someone who's settled, someone who's calm. Someone who's, who's, who's stable. So the, fuj, the fujar are not stable. They're just explosive. There's no stability. There's too much entropy. There's too much randomness. You don't know what's going to come next. And some people say that. I live on the edge, man. I don't know what I'm going to do next. But I'm excited to see what I'll do. Some people live on the edge. And some people actually find a thrill in that. I want to surprise myself with the amount of wrong that I'll do. I want to, I want to beat my, my record. Some people have that. That's fujur. That's fujur. That's literally the definition, the embodiment of fujur. And barara, as we mentioned, is what? It's to be upright. Go back to addalaka. Allah created you not to be a fragile. Allah created you to be, to have that, to have that what? To have that birr. Now what's interesting, some of the linguists make, and here's, if you want to take, like again, getting into the subtlety, they say, barara comes, yeah, barara or abra comes from what? And I'm going to need you to take notes here because it's very important. This is going to be very important. So, barara comes, even if you reduce it to a single root, it comes from bar. What does the word bar mean? Bar is what? Bar is land. Bar is land. Like uh, al bar wal bahr. And in, in the Quran, always compares bar, land, with bahr. What is, what is the land known for? Land is stable. But what is bahr? Bahr is a water body. What does the water do? Water is always wavy. So Allah gives this comparison between bar, stability, and bah, motion. And the word barara comes from the word bar. And the reason why land is given that, because it's upright, it's calm. There's stability. From where, from where we perceive it. Yes, it's always moving. Yes, of course, the earth is moving and the crust is moving. That, we're not denying that. We're not saying that the earth is stable from a gravitation or from like a physics point of view. We're saying from the way we perceive it. There's stability, there's predictability. And from the way that we perceive it, the ocean, the water bodies are constantly moving. So Allah's giving this comparison, the language itself captures this motion, the difference between someone who's living committed to Allah and someone who's living outside of the commitment to Allah. Now take it a step further. Language is important. That's why the Quran, you know subhanAllah, when you, when you study the language of the Quran, you're like, okay, I understand why the Quran is revealed in Arabic. Like I get it. I have no issue with that. Right? I understand why Ibri, why Hebrew was a language that Allah revealed in. Because of the power of the language. They're powerful languages, as we discussed. Very, very vivid and imaginative and precise and extremely logical. So, if you take it a step further, in Arabic, there is jam' takthir and jam' qilla. There's the super plural and then there's the plural. Barara and abrar. Who can tell me which one is the super plural and which one is just the plural? Barara. They come from the same word. They both mean upright. Barara is referring to who? Who does barara refer to? Who's paying attention? Barara refers to the angels or the humans? Hmm? Kiram, kiram and barara. Sorry? Angels. So barara is angels. Abrar is what? Humans. In the abrar. Lafi na'im. See, see the connection. The language is the same. The angels are noble. They have this a form of bar, right? And then this is the human being has a form of, you know, like bir uh, or bar as well. What is the, which one is the super plural? Which one is the regular plural? Barara is the super plural or the other way? Go ahead, sister, yeah? Barara is the super plural. And abrar is the actual, just the regular plural. Why does Allah use super plural for the angels and use regular plural for the humans? 
So there are linguists who will actually get to this level and they will say, wow, there are way more angels than the humans. Angels outnumber the humans. So when Allah describes the angels, He uses the super plural. And their bir is much more intense than our bir. So Allah uses the super plural for them. And you see this consistent across the Qur'an. Now how is it possible that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he's just coming up with this himself, and he's reciting this from Salah, how is it that he's able to get it consistently every single time with that level of precision? How is that possible? Like just think about that. And how is it possible that like this, the small little subtleties of the language, you'll find them to be again consistent across the Quran. It's powerful. So, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ يَصْلَوْنَهَا يَوْمَ الدِّينِ When will they get to see this? When will they get to experience this jaheem? Yasla, yasla means what? Yasla is a very important word. Think about salah. Salah. So salah, from salah, relationship, and also from salli. Salli means burn. Because it burns the sins away. It burns the sins away. Think about salmu. Salmu means continuous. So yaslawnaha literally means it's as if they're connected to Jahannam. And they're tasting Jahannam continuously, con- consistently, without a break. Without a break. It's like they're tasting it. They're staring and it's staring back at them consistently. And they're burning in it. Imagine that word captures all those meanings. When do they get to go through that? Yawm ad On the day where the balances are clear. Before that, are they going to experience it? Maybe they'll experience a little bit of punishment to wake them up. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills good for them because of some sincerity or good that they have. But most people, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. There's a day, there's a day, there's a day, there's a day, there's a day. And the analogy that Shaykh Allah gives, and I love this analogy, is like, it's like shopping. When you're in the mall, when you're in the store shopping, nobody's going to come to you like, Hey, did you pay for that? Did you pay for this? Did you pay for this? Are you sure you can handle this? Do you, do you have enough on your credit card? Do whatever you want. Get what you, can, you can have your super card, fill it up with everything. But on the way out, what do you have to do? You have to check out. And part of checking out is what? You have to pay. It's the same thing. In this dunya, go ahead, you have the freedom, do whatever you want. You can put anything in your car, or you can keep anything of your, out, out of your car. First, the same thing. You can have a life of uh, truth and commitment and love and this and this and that, or you can have a, 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 like a, something otherwise. You decide. So, يَصْلَوْنَهَا يَوْمَ الدِّينَ the day that they check out, the day that they have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when they will be exposed to it. And they will not be able to غَابَ يَغِيبُ means to be absent from the sight. So they will not be able to avoid the stare of Jahannam. Can you imagine the vivid imagery? It's like Jahannam is given a frame. It's as if it's a beam that's looking at you. And that you can't avoid the stare. Imagine like the height of punishment. The height of punishment. Like imagine being whipped and hurt and all that pain and you can't avoid the gaze of your torturer. And when the one who's saying this will happen to you is the most merciful, the most loving chooses to punish you in this way, what does that mean? You deserved it. You deserve it. That you've done something to earn this. That it's not done from like a a wrathful or an avenging being, but a being that loves and has given everyone the chance to attain salvation. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمَ الدِّينِ ثُمَّ مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينِ ثُمَّ مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينِ The repetition again. What will make you or how will you come to know what will happen on the Day of Judgment? Oh, how will you come to know what will happen on the Day of Judgment? Imagine Allah is repeating it twice. How, like imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is reminding us here, you're so small, you're so limited that you can never fully guess or capture fully the image of what's going to happen on that day. Again, how, like why would you even, why would you even think 
yourself to be able to come to realize fully what will happen. I'm only sharing with you episodes. Little windows into Jahannam. Little windows into Jannah. But there's so much more that you'll never, ever, ever be able to know. But I've told you enough. I've told you enough. To get you to love and to fear and to have that balance in between to pursue goodness and to stay away from evil. It's enough. But there's so much detail that you'll never be able to know. يَوْمَ لَا تَمْلِكُ نَفْسٌ لِنَفْسٍ شَيْئًا وَالْأَمْنُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لِلَّهِ The day that no soul will be able to have control over what will happen to another soul. وَالْأَمْنُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لِلَّهِ And the final command and order on that day will be absolutely for Allah and for nobody else. Can you imagine? As this is Abbasah again. Everybody will turn away from everybody else. No son will be able to help. No daughter will be able to help. No mom. No child. Nobody will be able to help anybody else. Well, amr yawma idhin lillah. Now, amr, amr, or actually, tamliku, tamliku, from milk to possess, to acquire, to seize, to own, to dominate, to control, to be capable. Imagine Allah saying, none of this will be given to you. You don't have possessions, you don't have control, you can't seize control, you can't dominate, you can't plan, you can't articulate a coup d'etat. There's no way. It's done. That's it. You had the control in the dunya, now you're checking out. This day you have absolutely no control. Your body will speak. You don't even have control over your own body. Your body will testify against you. Now, quickly, I want us to open. Uh, we have you know seven minutes. We just gave like a brief synoptic summer over Surah Al-Fatah and there's so many beautiful images to capture I want to just quickly transition into the next Surah Surah Al-Mutaffafeen وَيْنُ الْمُتَفَّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَلُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ and we sent you the notes so you have them inshallah to read Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Remember the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam attributed to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Whoever wishes to say the day of resurrection as though it's happening in front of them Let them read Surah Al-Takweer Surah Al-Infitar and Surah Al-Inshiqaq Surah Al-Infitar and Al-Takweer are next to each other And then you have a break Surah Al-Mutafafeen comes in and then you have after Surah Al-Mutafafeen Surah Al-Inshiqaq So in the middle of the three surahs that talk about the events of the day of resurrection Describing very similar events, you have Surah Al-Mutafafeen right there in between. What does that tell you? Why is that Surah right there in between? Why is that Surah sandwiched? And what does it tell us? It begins with, just to focus on the first three ayat, because it's important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ Muqatil mentions wail is a valley in Jahannam that has 70,000 this and 70,000 that. Very vivid, you can read the description. Very vivid punishment and a valley in Jahannam that is absolutely despicable in its, in its, its, its ability to inti- intimidate and to really evoke a sense of fear. Or wail could be wool. Like Arabs say, wailun al-Arab min sharrin qad iqtara. They say, what a, what a scary news coming for the Arabs, right? Wail. It's used to basically refer to uh, a sad thing that's about to happen, a very horrific thing that's about to happen. Mutaffif comes from ta fa fa. Ta fa fa. And ta fa fa, let me just open the note here so you can see it quickly. And you have all these notes in the WhatsApp group. So if you haven't um, gotten them, please do open them in your WhatsApp, inshallah, groups. You have access to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ The word ta fa fa comes from basically to margin, to limit, to be little in quantity, to incomplete, to be incomplete, or to give short measure and short weight. Those are the root words that are focused here. The word, if it's flipped, it becomes tufan. Or, uh, or itfan, which actually refers to something that is full and overflowing and brimful, like a tufan from a flood. But the way it's used here, it refers to basically cutting things short. So 
So Allah says, Woe to the ones who like to cut things short and to give little. Like to, to give little. When they themselves take from people, they like to take more than what they deserve. And when they give to people, they give a little bit less than what the person paid for. And this surah is revealed at the end of Mecca and at the beginning of Medina, in that transition. So you have the commercial trade in Mecca, and then you have the trade also in Medina. And you have this habit that has become very clear with the merchants. What do they do? They have double standards. Literally, you know, when back in the day they used to have weights, uh, the balance, you know the balance, so they put, you know, uh, the big weights, I'm sure some of you remember. Uh, so like, you want a half a pound of uh, meat, you have the half a pound, you'll put it on the scale, and then basically you will, you know, measure the half a pound. And what people, I remember this actually in Egypt, I would, you know, sometimes you go to the market and you have people that will do this. What they will do is they will add a little bit weight on the place where you put the meat. So, Instead of having a half a pound, it'll be like, you know, uh, a little bit less. So that way they think they're, they're, they're making more money. And it's cheating because you're paying for half a pound, but you're getting less. But when they're, when they're buying, they will do the opposite. They will have their own weights designed and they will take those weights with them. And the weights are chipped on the inside to actually have what? To have basically less or more. And they will have those double weights and they will use them interchangeably. And they will use them with different people. If I like you, I will give you, you know, the, the full. And if I don't, I'll give you the, the half. So this is how Allah is discussing here. The people who have what? They have double standards. Now some of us can say, Alhamdulillah, I'm not in business. So this doesn't actually apply to me. I am saved. But in reality, this applies to each and every one of us. Because although it's talking about weights, this applies to every aspect of our life in having double standards. With your wife, you expect more than you give. So you expect it to be a perfect 10, but you're like a five, right? With your children, you don't give them love, but you expect respect, and double standards. With your boss, or actually with your workers, you don't pay them enough, but you expect them to give their soul and heart into your business. And you treat them like they're you treat them like their bosses too, and you're running around like why do, why are they not motivated? Why don't they care about the project? Why aren't they putting their best? I'm sick and tired of these lazy. But you you're not giving what you would need to give to receive what you're looking for. Right? And this applies even in relationships, in work, in, in, in business, in every aspect. So imagine what Allah even in salah, in salah, the scholars say. You don't give the salah, the prayer, its full attention, but you expect the salah to protect you from evil. And I heard that you're supposed to be like, isn't the salah supposed to protect you from lust and you know this, this bad, these bad things? But look, I'm praying and it's not doing that for me. Well, you're really giving it the full right that it deserves. It's like you expect more than what you give. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning in Surah Al-Mutafifin at the beginning. And that image will be further developed. And it, when Allah places the surah in between the three that talk about the day of resurrection, the scholars of commentary say that one of the very first things that Allah will hold people accountable for is their double standards in dealing with one another. So Allah will hold you accountable also in your double standard with Him. You give Allah nothing, but you expect everything from Allah. Right? And you give other people nothing, but you expect everything from them. SubhanAllah. So be careful of having those double standards in your relationships, with your family, with your children, with your loved ones, in your business. And make sure that every penny that you earn is going to be halal. And I want you, as you're preparing for this, inshallah, before we come to the next class, go back to the surah that we've discussed before, and imagine how every surah opens up and now we're opening the next surah with an image from the market capturing this cheating that happens and it's so subtle remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that nothing will go to waste nothing will be unaccounted for 
So imagine if Allah is saying, Woe be to the one who's cutting corners in giving rights that are deserved and in taking more than what is earned. If Allah is saying a terrible punishment awaits that person, what about the person who's not just cutting corners? What about the person who's not even doing that? And not even giving? What about the person who's cheating and lying and actually like blatant in the corruption? What about the person who's not even hiding it? But gets away with it. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to be cautious of that. So here we see the Meccan and Medina and Quran instilling, connecting the events that lead to resurrection to the behavior in the market, to the adab with your wife, with your husband, with your loved ones, connecting the universal realities to your akhlaq on a day to day basis, beginning with the akhlaq with Allah and your akhlaq with others. And one of the most beautiful ayahs in the Quran, and I'll finish with this, the ayah is, وَلَا تَبَخَصُوا النَّاسَ أَشْيَاءَهُمْ Don't underestimate people's belongings. You know, you go into the market, and you, ha- you haggle, you haggle, 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 and then you come out saving 10, 20, 30 dollars. For you, that 10, 20, 30 dollars means nothing. But for that business person, that could have been the profit margin. And you're like, oh man, look, I got this for a deal. I got it for an amazing price. I'm so proud of myself. That haggling. And sometimes, of course, like in the Prophet, like if in, in certain places, it's the norm, it's expected. And people will, you know, give you a price 10 times and expect you to bring it down. But be careful with those who are what? Those who are kind. And don't take advantage of them. Which is why, subhanAllah, in Egypt, we are yeah, programmed to haggle. As a kid, one of my favorite pastimes. <laughs> Just to go to the market and haggle. Sometimes I wouldn't even need the thing. I would just go for the, just for the fun of haggling. And just the, the culture, right? And one of the best things, one of the best, like my mom sometimes she would ask me, let's go shopping together. And I, I have no interest in shopping, but I'm excited to like see her in her element, you know, like the back and forth, mashallah. You know, it's, it's, inter- it's, it's an interesting like reality. And it's become such a part of the culture. And in certain places it's expected, it's, it's, it's fine. But at certain times, like you know when you push it too much. Right? You know, the whole like, I'm gonna walk out, like, oh, you're gonna sell this for them for $100? Astaghfirullah, you put it down, you walk away. Okay, come back, come back, come back. No, I don't wanna come back, I don't wanna even look at, like that's crazy. I saw Abdullah down the street, he's selling it for $42. Abdullah doesn't exist. And there's nowhere in the universe that's selling it for $42. Alright? It's like, I came here, I'm a loyal customer. The guy is like, you've never shopped at the place before. My ancestors used to shop at this place. My grandfather always bought from your grandfather. The store wasn't open 10 years ago. All this nonsense, lying and exaggeration. And the person that is doing it knows you're lying and you know you're lying. But it becomes part of the what? Part of the hustle. SubhanAllah. It's so, and, and the Quran is telling us to be cautious of that. To give people their full. And the Prophet Muhammad he wasn't known to have it. He, he didn't like that. He didn't like, he would give people their full. And there are subhanAllah, yani, there are three levels when it comes to these business interactions. The first level is like this, Al-Mutafafeen, which basically try to cut as many corners as possible. Then there are people who basically have Adil. So the first level is this, the the the, the Then you have the Adil. They'll give you exactly what you paid for. They literally measure over and over again to make sure it's exactly one kilo. And then there are people who deal with you with fadl. You know, you go buy a kilo, they'll add a little bit extra. And they say, just in case there's something, you know, wrong, just in case there's a, you know, you open it and you find one of them that doesn't taste as sweet as the rest. Here's an extra. Here's an extra. And there are people that are like that, subhanAllah, everywhere. And some of them, Allah, they don't make, they don't make much. They go home with like, making you know, $50 in that day and they're happy like alhamdulillah at least my income is halal at least I was able to you know do justice and you know other people like this is the worst businessman ever bro you're not meant for business go do something else go teach or something go do something that you know is, is more empathetic in business you can't be you can't have you can't have love in business man but Islam says no otherwise you can't have love in business you should have love in business and everything that you get away with in this dunya what happens you pay in the akhirah. So don't get into the habit of cutting corners. 
And please, I'll finish with this. Let us not further contribute to the reputation that Muslim business people are terrible to deal with. How many of us have stories of contractors that we had to pay another contractor after to fix the work? How many of us know driving instructors? Oh, Abdullah, yeah, no problem. Habibi, don't even worry about it. I'll write you the thing. And you completed the 10 hours. And sometimes you actually like get actually ask imams to do this. I mean, randomly get a request from a brother. Assalamu alaikum. You knew my sister's brother's cousin. Sister's brother's cousin. That's me, yeah? <laughs> and I know we've never met, right? The other brother, yeah? But I would like for you to write a reference letter for me for the University of Medina. Tabakhi, like, how, how, we've never met. How am I going to write? That's okay. I will tell you the qualities that Allah has given me. Please highlight my honesty. Please highlight my credibility. Please highlight my... I'm very perseverance. Very perseverance? What do you mean? That's not, that's not a, an adjective. Right? The spelling will be off. Like, it's terrible. And uh, I really need it by next week. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanallah, right? And you know, sometimes, like, even we get a habit of doing this. Like, sometimes what I'll do when somebody asks for a reference letter, send me a draft, I'll rewrite it. Just like, give me a sense of what you're looking for, and I'll rewrite it. But I know some people, they won't even rewrite. They say, send me a draft, and I'll just put my signature on it. You write your own reference letter, send it to me, and there you go, mashallah. Done. So we have to be careful when it comes to these ethics. It may seem like small little things, but in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are great. And these are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us accountable for on the day of resurrection. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who are committed to justice. May Allah forgive us for our shortcomings and our flaws. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be from those who deal with each other with ihsan and justice. Ya Rabbi Ameen. Subhanakallah wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.